Well, good morning. Would you stand with me one more time this morning as we pray? Well, let's pray together. Holy Spirit, breathe on your people again. Come with fresh wind. Come with fresh wind and breathe on your people. Awaken us to the beauty and the majesty of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. Awaken our hearts. Open our eyes. Open our ears. Help us gaze and see the beauty of Jesus. For when we see Jesus, everything else changes. Come, Holy Spirit. Blow and breathe on your people today so that we might rest secure in the declaration, it is finished, it is done. We trust you. We ask that your spirit would help us to hear your voice, the voice of the good shepherd, the voice of a good father, and that you might point us to Christ, your son. And may the words in my mouth and the movement and meditation of our hearts, may they be pleasing to you, our Lord, our rock, and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Well, good morning to you. It's such a joy uh, to be here again. My name's uh, Pastor Ben Gonzalez, and I get the privilege and the joy of working at the Texas District Office, so I... Uh, I get the, the opportunity to come to you today and to bring greetings from everybody on staff there. Uh, if you're new here to Zion, uh, just know that it's kind of our denominational uh, headquarters for the state of Texas, for the LCMS Church. And it's where we're on mission together and mission with you to see the gospel of Jesus Christ be preached to the nations. And so we are so excited to be a part of that. I bring greetings from uh, President Mike Newman, who is our president. And it, again, it is just a joy and an honor. I'm here, we're actually neighbors. I live in Hutto, so we're neighbors, okay? And my family's here, my wife uh, KJ's here, uh, been married for 25 years. My whole family takes up a row. <laughs> right? And they go a whole row, all right? So I have my uh, daughter Evelyn and her husband Daniel, my oldest son Tobias, my youngest son Cross, my youngest daughter Genesis, and her friend boy Noah. <laughs> we don't use the word boyfriend in our house, it's friend boy. And, oh man, by the glory of God, and I'm going to be a grandfather, first time, right? This is incredible, man. I, I actually have something to show more than the gray hair that I'm getting old, right? And so we're just excited. I, I won't tell you his name, that he's going to be named, but I'll give you a hint. It's, it's in your church name, and it's not Lutheran, and it's not church. <laughs> so uh, that's the first public announcement of that, so we may have to edit that out. Uh, but just so great uh, to be here, to just be on mission together for the sake of Jesus. If you have a Bible today, I know that we have the Sky Bible up here, but if you have your own Bible, um, Exodus chapter 3 is where we're going to be, and also 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 and 2. So if you have your own Bible today or uh, some kind of device on you, I'd love for you to follow uh, along uh, this morning as we uh, spend some time together in the Word of God. As I was preparing for Exodus chapter 3, one of the questions that came to mind was, was like, what is it in Ben, and I think, and it's also in you, what is it in us that when we see something strange that should actually cause us to uh, move away from, it actually draws us near? Have you ever thought about that? What is in you and what is in me that when we see something that could be strange or scary, there's something in our culture that when everything else should say run, we actually go towards it. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so what is it in us? And I'll give you some examples. We just got back from uh, South Padre, uh, spending some time there, and uh, my whole family went, had a great time together. Um, I'm always weary about getting into the ocean because I grew up in the late 1900s, and uh, when I grew up, there was a movie that was out, and uh, it was called Jaws. And um, as a kid, if you watch Jaws, you're like forever changed, right? And you always look at the ocean with skepticism. 
And, and so we're, we're going, I'm already weary. And then my kids, my two daughters are like, hey, dad, do you know somebody got attacked by a shark? And I'm like, okay, one, why are you telling me that before we go into the ocean? <laughs> like, what is it that makes you think this is good news to dad? That you should tell him, oh, yeah, there's, and, and then they say this, there's videos. <laughs> videos? Like, so my first thought is, who sits there and records somebody else being attacked? Who, who does that? See, there's something in us that draws us to strangeness. Here's another example, and this is personally, this has just been, but I'll scroll through YouTube, and every once in a while, there's, there's a video that comes across, and it's got a tornado in it. Okay, and so we're we know tornadoes here, right? Like we know tornadoes, but I thought, what is it about us that instead of running, we believe the best thing to do in that moment is to catch a tornado on video? And, and then here's what's interesting: I find myself talking to my phone, like trying to talk the people into running. Right? Like I'm screaming at my phone, run, Forrest, run, run. Because there's something about us that is strange in us that draws us to strange things. I want you to keep in mind that when we read Exodus chapter 3. Because something strange happens. And I want, you to, I want us to ask, what is it about that that draws us closer? If you have your Bible, let's... Let's start this. Exodus chapter 3. It says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, you got to understand there is some context here. There is some stuff that we're going to come back to in a minute. But it is fascinating. I think it's important for us to know that here is Moses who left the high palace of Egypt. And now he's serving in one of the most lowly jobs there is, a shepherd. And not only is that bad, but he's working for his father-in-law. Can you imagine those conversations? So he has left the high place of Egypt and through circumstances has found himself working for his father-in-law as a humble shepherd from a high place to a low place in humility. It, that's important. Verse 2. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So at this point, you should be thinking, should I stay here? Everybody say, that's strange. That's strange. So Moses, verse 3, thought, <laughs> I'll get closer. I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. Everybody say, that's strange. That's just strange. Verse 4, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush. Now it's talking. <laughs> Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. So there is an angel appearing in flames of fire within the bush. Then the bush doesn't burn up. And shouldn't that be enough for us to run? Then the bush talks. And then here's what's interesting. Moses talks back. <laughs> Say, that's strange. And then verse 5, finally something is said that actually makes sense. Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I'm the God of your father. He, the, the burning bush wants to make a connection for Moses. I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses recognized where he was. He recognized what he was in front of. And he hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now, there's so much to unpack here, just in these couple of verses. But because of our time this morning, I feel led as I prepared to really go after one thing. To really go after one thing, and what, what helped me is, is that our English language needs a little bit of help from the Hebrew language. 
And, and so the original context, the original language that this is written is in Hebrew. And that actually helps us because our, our English language doesn't give us the full weight of this. And the only reason why I'm using Hebrew is not to sound smarter, it's because I'm still paying off debt at the seminary. <laughs> so I, I get to use Hebrew, I get to use Greek because I'm still paying payments, okay? <laughs> but this really helps us. Look at verse two, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. The English language, whichever translation you have, uses the word bush. But the actual Hebrew word comes from a root word that's derived from a root word that means to prick. It means thorny. That's what it means. So it doesn't really mean it was a bush. What it, what it means is that, that the bush in which Yahweh appears as a flame of fire was some sort of pricking or thorny bush. So it was a thorn bush, and not only was it a thorn bush, but it was a thorn bush that was not consumed. Now stay with me for a second. Moses moves from the high place, the high palace of Egypt, comes in humility, comes to a thorn bush, not just a bush, but a thorn bush that's not consumed. Could it be? Could it be, friends, that Exodus 3 is really not about Moses? Could it be that Exodus 3 really isn't about Israel? Could it be that Exodus 3 is really pointing to someone or something greater? Could it be, and I propose that this morning, that the thorn bush, that Jesus is the thorn bush? That Jesus is the one who left the high place, who came in humility and humbled himself even to the point of death. That Jesus, when crucified, a thorny bush in the form of a crown was placed on his head. That Jesus, while he died, death did not consume him. Amen. That death overcame death. <laughs> That if you were to look in the eyes of Jesus, if you were to lock eyes with Jesus, what would you see? Fire. Fire. And this isn't just how you read Exodus 3. This is how you read the entire Old Testament. We are looking for the burning one. We read and always looking for the one who wears a thorn, a crown of thorns. We read it and looking for the one who's not consumed, but is the all-consuming fire. That Jesus is the point, and this is how we should always read the Old Testament. Jesus is the tree of life. Jesus is the tent of meeting. Jesus is the tabernacle. Jesus is the one lifted up on the pole that everyone who looks at is healed. Jesus is the rock that should have only been struck once because he died once for all. Jesus is Noah's ark. Jesus is the great high priest. Jesus is the better prophet, and Jesus is the better king. This is how we read the Old Testament. You better say something. I'm going to start running around. <laughs> this is why when the religious rulers who had all the doctrine, had all the theology, had read all the books, had it all memorized. When they came to Jesus, he says, you search the scriptures in John 5, 39, because you think they give you eternal life but the scriptures point to me. They point to me. Every time you crack that open, you're eventually gonna get to Jesus. You're eventually gonna get to Jesus because Jesus is the point. And it's not just, listen, it's not just any Jesus. This ain't build a bear Jesus. It's not just the Jesus of your making. It's not just the Jesus you wish into, into creation. I mean, I mean, that's like, that's like Bible study 101. You didn't create anything. God created you. So we don't get to make up our own Jesus. No, Jesus is very insistent. He's very insistent about who and what type of Messiah. And you don't have to wait to Matthew to get there. He's the one who humbles himself to death on a tree. 
He's the one who wears a crown of thorns, who dies but's not consumed by death. He is the crucified one. And it is strange, but it's the thing that should stop us in our tracks and pay attention to and cause us to gaze at the one hanging on a tree. Jesus Christ crucified is still worth contending for today. The cross is still enough. And it's not just enough for the nations, it's still enough for the church. It's still enough for the people of God because the gospel still works. Jesus Christ and himself crucified is still enough. Jesus Christ crucified is still attractive. And when he's lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. And if the message of the cross, if the message of the crucified one no longer moves us, that's a tragedy. It's a tragedy if the bleeding one no longer moves us. It's a tragedy if we need something else to be added in order to be attracted. It's a tragedy if the crucified one is not enough to catch our hearts and cause us to stop and gaze at his beauty. And maybe it's because we don't really see him rightly. If we need something more than the one that laid his life down for his friends, the one who bleeds, the lamb who was slain, the lamb who takes away the sin of the world, the suffering servant, the tree that's chopped down, the blood-stained cross, if we need something more to catch our attention, then what does that say about him and what does that say about our hearts? The one who says, when I'm lifted up, you will know that I am that I am. In other words, Jesus says, when, you, when he's lifted up on the cross, we'll see him for who he is. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, Paul had some words on this that I think are uh, so important for us to return to and always come back to. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Because Paul, of all the people, it seemed that Christ crucified was enough for him. Listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 5. And so it is with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. Look at verse 2. For I resolved, I decided, I determined to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I determined. Have you ever met a determined person? You might be married to one. <laughs> If you got teenagers, you've met a determined person. I have determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and himself crucified. Now, the question is, did Paul know a lot? Yes. He was discipled by Gamaliel. He was a Pharisee of Pharisee. He had the whole Torah memorized. He knew all the religious practices. He read all the books. He went all to all the Bible schools. He did it all, and he knew everything. And where did that lead him? Killing Christians. Persecuting the church. That's where it led him. So he says, when I come to you, I don't have another subject. When I come to you, I don't have another topic. I got one sermon. <laughs> and it's the same as the father's sermon. Because if you listen to Abba preach, he's only got one message. Jesus, my son whom I love. The one that I have given to lay his life down to show the world that anyone who believes in me will have life and everlasting life. There's only one message, Paul says. He only has one subject. He has only one theme. He doesn't have sermon series. His sermon series is Jesus. <laughs> wow. So Paul says, it's not just that I know Jesus, but I've determined to know nothing else.
but Jesus and himself crucified. That means that the Holy Spirit took a scalpel to his religious edition. Where he would say, I got nothing else to talk about except Jesus Christ and himself crucified. Do you know in the early church when people would have a vision of the resurrected Lord, they would say, we've seen the Lord, man. We've seen the Lord. We had a vision of the Lord. Do you know what the early church mothers and fathers, do you know what their questions would be to see if that was legit? Does he have holes in his hands? Does he have holes in his feet? Does he have a pierced side? No? Then we don't know that guy. <laughs> we don't know that Jesus. See, we don't know a Jesus that doesn't have holes in his hands. We don't know a Jesus that doesn't have his holes in his feet and a pierced side. We don't, we don't know a Jesus that didn't bleed. We don't know a Jesus that didn't suffer and die. We don't know a Jesus that wasn't hung on a, on, on a tree. Oh, no, we don't know that one. I recently was listening to a, a, a pastor, and I, I, try to, I try to spend some time with older pastors because I, I still think, I still think there's, there's something for older pastors to teach this generation. And so I try to go in humility and, and, and recognize that there, there's a generation above me that still needs to be honored. And if there's a generation like mine that's willing to honor an older generation and that older generation is willing to welcome this generation, then I think there's some powerful stuff that can happen. So I try to find the older generation and just, I, I just try to lean in and just in humility and just try to ask, you know, what, what do you think about the, the state of the church? What do you think about the state of what's happening in, 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 in the church today? And I was listening to one of them and, and he talked about how over the last two or three decades, how things have shifted in the church. And I said, you know, what do you mean by shifted? He goes, it just, it just seems like today that the gospel needs our help. It, it, it seems like in, in the church today, there's this belief, there's this posture, there's these decisions that are made that makes it appear like somehow the gospel needs our help. Like in order for the gospel to actually have power, it needs man's help. And as he was talking through to, with me, I I, there were some things that were resonating with me. There were some triggers, I'll be honest, but there were some things that were starting to resonate with me. Like when I, I first came out of ministry, I, I remember going to, to conferences and I remember going to, you know, if you wanted your church to grow and you wanted to, to you know, build your platform and, you know, you wanted to do your thing, this is the conference that you go to. And I, I just remember hearing from guys on the stage say things like, if you bore people, you're sinning. Wait, wait, okay, wait, wait. So if I, if, I, if I bore people, I'm a sinner. So what, what really means is if I don't tell the right story, if I don't tell the right illustration, if I'm not animated enough, if I don't preach the paint off the wall, that, that somehow I'm sinning. Now, let me just pause here. Can you imagine the amount of pressure that puts on a guy like me? Of the stuff I need to come up with now? Like, like the pressure. Now, because what's interesting, in the early church, the pressure wasn't on me. The pressure was on you. For you to come with your heart right, to come and recite the very words of Jesus in the Lord's Prayer. That you were to come and have prepare your heart to worship before worship, to prepare before worship. To have your heart right to take the very body and blood of Jesus. That you were to prepare your hearts. You were to find some way and somehow as a people of God to enter into the presence of God as if it was holy ground. And you didn't need somebody to make that happen for you. You would prepare your heart to come and have somebody open the sacred text and to hear the very words of Yahweh being spoken, not man's word, Yahweh's word to be read to you. There was just something 
That somehow now the pressure, and it was the pressure wasn't just on you. The pressure was on the Holy Spirit to do what man can't do, change hearts. So in verse 3, he says, so I came to you in weakness. With great fear and great trembling. Let me ask you, when's the last time you heard a gospel presentation done in weakness and great fear and great trembling? We wouldn't hear it because there'd be another meeting after the service to talk about what's wrong with the pastor. We got to get him a sabbatical. <laughs> But what if he just came from the burning bush and understood what he was about to do was holy ground? That he was stepping on the holy ground and if the spirit didn't show up, he and the hearers were done for. So he says, my message and my preaching were not with wise and pervasive words, but with a demonstration of the spirit's power. So that your faith may not rest on man. So that your faith won't rest on a preacher. So that your faith won't rest on words, his word. But you would rest, your faith would rest on the power of God. Can you imagine what would happen if someone just stood and declared the crucified one? And that God would use that to be the power through his Holy Spirit. And that it wouldn't have to be doctored up. Nothing else would have to be added up. That the crucified, the message of the gospel, the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and return of Jesus would be enough for the church. That the gospel, because a pastor didn't save me. A church didn't save me. A Bible study didn't save me. A program didn't save me. Jesus saved me. Because he's the only one that could go down into the pit because he's been there before. He descended in order to ascend. And he's the only one that can come into a pit and grab this brother out. It's the power of God. If we need a more dynamic and creative presentation before our hearts are stirred. I'm just telling you, that's a scary thing. It's a scary thing. I want to share with you one last passage today. And this passage frightens me. 1 Corinthians 1.17. Again, Paul. The previous chapter. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. See, back then, everybody was all pumped up about, well, I got baptized by this guy, and I got baptized by this guy, and I got baptized at this church, and I got baptized at this church. And, and Paul's like, cut it out. In fact, I didn't even come to do that. I came to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence. Here it is. Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. In other words, I could stand up here in a way and say some things eloquently, perfectly, humorously in such a way that may fill the room, but it'll empty the cross. That's scary to Ben. That's scary to anybody who, who preaches the gospel. And it's not just pastors. We're all called to preach the gospel. But there is a way, and this is scary, for us to come from our own power, our own eloquence, our own strength, where we think we're filling things up and we're actually emptying the cross. So today, what if we return to the burning bush? This is not about guilt and condemnation. This is about invitation. It's about being invited again to the burning bush. You remember when your hearts first stirred? You remember when the gospel light came on? You remember when you highlighted everything in your Bible? <laughs> Even the stuff you didn't understand?
You remember when no one had to, no one had to make you pray? No one had to guilt you into prayer? Remember when you just fed yourself and just being in the presence of the crucified king was enough? Remember when your heart came alive? Remember when the Holy Spirit took the word of God and made your heart alive again? You remember when he took you from death to life? Remember when he took you from an orphan to, to a child? You remember when he brought beauty from ashes in your life? To seem as the crucified one, to gaze again on the wondrous cross, to love the cross again. And you can't behavior this. You have to ask the Holy Spirit for it. You cannot behavior this. You cannot guilt yourself into this. The power of the Holy Spirit has to enliven your affection and love for the beauty of the crucified king. And no pastor can preach that into you. No church can disciple you into that. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It has to enliven your heart and say, I love him. And he's enough. And his blood's enough. And the cross is enough. So what in the world does this have to do with Father's Day? Everything. Everything. Because you have a good father. And he loves you. And I don't know what your circumstance is. And I have no idea what your relationship is with your earthly father. But I'm here to tell you, you got a good father. And he gave his son so you could live. And it cost. And it cost him everything. It cost him everything. It cost him his son who bled, died, was mocked. And even when he's on the cross and he's being mocked, he still prays for people. That's our king who gets beaten and crucified. And when he's on the cross, he still prays for people. This is the one we love. We don't need anything to add on. The cross is enough. Let's pray. Help us, Holy Spirit. Help us. Help us. Gently bring your scalpel this morning. Gently bring your scalpel this morning and remove anything that in us that believes can be added to the finished work of the cross. Whether that's our parenting or whether that's our, our, how, we, how we are as, as a husband and wife or how well we do at our jobs. Lord, take a scalpel gently, gently put us on the table and don't let us get up until you're done. Help us, Holy Spirit, so that we might be in love again and again and again with the one who's everything. His name's Jesus. It's in his beautiful name we pray. Amen.